Food & Wine Insider is a weekly look at a $1.5 trillion industry touching every American. Devoted to the business of purveying food and decanting wines, Food & Wine Radio is a unique program highlighting not food recipes or wine vintages, but how to make a profit while satisfying America's palates. In this competitive but highly rewarding sector, many men and women have made profits while fulfilling a dream. Food & Wine Insider is all about better managing any business involving food & wine. Each week, your co-hosts sit down with successful restaurateurs, food mavens, winery vendors, store owners, food suppliers, and other leaders in the worldwide industry that centers on foodstuff and wine. In frank give-and-take sessions, guests and panelists talk about the business of bringing healthy and pleasurable foods and wines to others. Your food and wine radio host are Ann Daw, former president of the Specialty Food Association, and a longtime food executive who has held senior positions both here and abroad with Kraft Foods and Philip Morris. Don Mazella, a nationally known business commentator. On each show, they invite leaders of the world's culinary and wine industries to share the secrets of their success. Visit us at foodandwineinsider.com. And our next guest is Joy Stevenson Laws. She is the founder of, of, of a lot of things, and we're, we're going to get into this, of Proactive Health Labs. It provides tools. Um, it's, this is amongst other things she does, tools needed to achieve optimal health. Stevenson Laws is also the founding and managing partner of Stevenson, Aquisto, and Coleman, a firm specializing in healthcare, uh, I could go on and on, but Joy, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, uh, 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 Joy. Uh, tell us, uh, give us a little bit about your background, uh, uh, and then I, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Anne because there's so many questions uh, and thoughts we want to hear. But a little bit about your background. You're also an attorney. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm an attorney, I'm a healthcare attorney, but if I were to put everything in a nutshell, I would say that I'm a, I'm an, I, I try to be an educated healthcare consumer. <laughs> but I've been, a 30, I've, been a, I've been a healthcare attorney for about 30 years, and um, as a result, I got to know the area very well, and um, using my experience to perhaps try and educate others and as to how they can be more proactive about their health and, and get the best out of our healthcare system. Well, I'm going to turn it over to Anne. I, I'm fascinated and I want to learn a lot more. Hi, thank you. Hi, hi Joy. Uh, welcome to Food and Wine Insider. I have so many questions for you because uh, I was reading all of your uh, posts. Um, so before we talk about your new book, which is Minerals, the Forgotten Nutrient, um, Your Secret Weapon for Getting and Staying Healthy, I, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about some of your posts. One of your mm -hmm. posts was... Uh, how knowing your insulin level can help prevent more than diabetes after 60. You talk about excess body weight and lack of exercise, which can increase insulin tolerance. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, I guess the, the purpose of the blog was to, to make consumers more aware that, you know, checking your insulin levels can be, a, be an indication, an early indication of, um, you know, diabetes. The, the, what we're used to seeing on our blood work when we go to the doctor is, you know, glucose and um, at, um, the, 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 um, the A1C test. And, and those are obviously necessary. But if we also check our insulin, we can be we can be even more proactive and avoid issues before they they occur. So, and there are things you can do to reverse your insulin tolerance as well, which 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 is an easier fix. So that was the whole purpose behind that blog. And obviously, there are things like maintaining a healthy weight, diet, all the things you hear about all you know all the time. Those are you know, easy fixes and easy changes that we can make in our life in our lifestyle. That's terrific. You had a, another post. Um, it's perfect because we just turned the year. Um, mm -hmm. it's, are you sabotaging your New Year's healthy eating resolution with artificial sweeteners? You mentioned oh, that yeah. artificial 
<laughs> you mentioned that artificial sweeteners can also trigger excess weight and maybe yes. stevia, which is uh, maybe stevia is a good alternative. I wonder if you could, you know, explain a little bit more in terms of how that works. I, I think we've all lived through the, gee, I, I feel less guilty about having this, you know, burger <laughs> uh, because I have the Diet Coke, but you know, how that really is kind of working against our bodies being able to properly uh, manufacture uh, what we need to, to have good nutrition. That's right, because, because so many of my friends, as I mentioned in the blog, will, will go out and, you know, will, they'll, they'll eat so you know a bunch of food, and then they say, you know what, I'm just going to have some coffee, and I'm just going to put some, stevia, you know, st not stevia, but artificial sweetener in it. And um, there's so many studies that, that, suggest it, that suggest that it will, you know, contribute to not only weight gain, but it will, you know, contribute to dementia, stroke, um, tons of health risks. Obviously, being the new year, we're concerned about weight gain as well, and it tricks your brain into thinking that you, into wanting more sugar because of, just because of how it's made up. So, in in simple terms, it's not something that we should do because we're not accomplishing the purpose that we're we're trying to accomplish. That is to lose weight or reduce calories. You're really increasing calories because you're because of the message that it sends to your brain. Uh, um, the, the 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 whole concept of you know, artificial anything should be disbanded because the body likes to use natural products to, to as nutrients. So when you give it fake products, it doesn't respond the same way as it does if if you provide natural, you know, organic or products. And and that's pretty much the message I'm trying to impart there. You know, you have so many wonderful posts. Everybody has to go to your website and read them all. I was reading them all, and I was like, how do I pick a couple that I think are really fantastic? Uh -oh. <laughs> so they're all wonderful. Um, you did have another one that I thought was really intriguing, and the importance of vitamin C for older women and a few warning signs, because you talk about vitamin C deficiency. Um, I think it was 10 to 26% of men and 7 to 14% of women Mm -hmm. um, our, our vitamin C, we don't think of vitamin C, you know, we tend to think about maybe D and uh, maybe course, E and course, A and of all of those, but vitamin C is also important. And um, right. you mentioned in there that for boomer women, uh, mm -hmm. the recommended daily allowance is really more like 400 milligrams. So the recommended daily is 75 per day. And mm -hmm. that there are higher risks of heart disease, stroke, and certain cancers. You also yes. it talk, you talk about it's necessary to help bodies heal and better metabolize carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Back to your other point about the artificial sweeteners, uh, mm -hmm. boost the immune system, lower hypertension, and yes. so how do you know if you're deficient and what should you do about it? Yes, so um, it is pretty easy to know if you're deficient. The problem is that no many of us don't ask because we don't expect that we might be low in vitamin C because we eat more than likely we eat veggies and fruits regularly. And we, you know, we, we assume that if we eat these healthy foods, that vitamin C is one of the last things that we're going to be deficient in. And, you know, many of us too associate vitamin C deficiency with, you know, bleeding gums and scurvy. You remember back in the old days when, or even when I went to school, you probably, you know, I heard that vitamin C deficiency manifests itself with scurvy. Well, you don't see scurvy much anymore necessarily. You don't see a bunch of people walking around with bleeding gums. But, but what we do see are the effects of vitamin C deficiency manifesting itself in many other ways than the traditional way that we're told it would manifest itself in. And these chronic diseases that we have, such as when our wounds don't heal very well, many diabetics, as an example, have wounds that don't heal well. And to the extent that we're, doctors will suggest that they amputate their, you know, their limbs because the, the wounds aren't healing. Well, there are studies that suggest that vitamin C deficiency should be checked when, when you have diabetics with wounds that don't heal well because many people are vitamin C deficient and don't know it, and, they don't, and doctors don't necessarily test for it routinely. So as consumers, we need to ask for these tests. We need to know that these tests exist and ask for them. Um, overcooking our foods, 
we'll kill the vitamin C. So what, what we need to do is to ensure that we eat more raw foods or steam our foods that we don't lose, where we don't use, lose the, the nutrients. In addition to that, as we age, our ability, our body's ability to absorb minerals or vitamins or whatever, in nutrients in general, may decline. So it's critical that we test for nutrients as we age, especially as we age and make sure that we're balanced, that we don't have too much or too little, and vitamin C is no exception. So it's really important for us to be aware that we should test for our nutrient balance. When we go to the doctor, just ask, the doc, you know, beyond the routine test that you give me on my annual physical, where I only see uh, sodium and potassium and calcium on those tests, are there, I have other nutrients that my body needs, can you test for these for me? You know, and people talk a lot about vitamin D, and that's, that's, you know, that's commonly known now that we need to be testing for vitamin D. But that, like vitamin C, vitamin A, vitamin E, you know, we can be low in those vitamins too. And as, as the research shows, there, there are a number of people that are low. And when we have symptoms, we have to remember that one of the first questions that we might want to ask is, are those symptoms caused by a deficiency in any one of my nutrients? And deficiency, nutrient deficiency is something that's common. It happens if we take medications. Medications work when they, you know, they deplete our nutrients, but they work. So if we know we're going to be taking a medication that's going to deplete our meds, I mean, deplete our nutrients, then it, it behooves us to test for those nutrients to make sure that they're balanced. And what we need to discuss with our doctors what we need to do to ensure that we keep them balanced and not have the the horrible side effects that some of those medications may cause. Well, that, that is really fabulous advice. Um, and it's a great segue to your new book, um, Minerals, the Forgotten Nutrient, Your Secret Weapon for Getting and Staying Healthy. Tell us what mm -hmm. you've discovered and what people should know about minerals and their impact on our health and well-being. Right. So minerals, I, let, let me put it in context a little bit. Um, sure. There are, yeah, because it, 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 well, I, I kind of like to hopefully keep it simple. Um, there are six basic nutrients that we need to live and survive. And you've heard about most of them already. You've heard about carbohydrates. You've heard about protein. You've heard about water. You've heard about fats. You've heard about vitamins. And, and we sometimes hear about minerals. But the, the one, when I was doing the research in, in nutrition and, and health in general, I noticed that most people hear about all the other ones, but they knew very little about minerals beyond knowing that too much sodium can give you hypertension, that calcium is good for strong bones, that perhaps, you know, you need potassium for if you're an athlete, you, you need potassium or whatever. But there's so many other critical minerals that are out there that are necessary for health and well-being, like, you know, magnesium, uh, which more people are becoming more aware of now. But you have, and obviously, iron. There, there is um, selenium. There is um, the molybdenum. There, there's so many other minerals that copper, zinc, that are critical for our well-being, our immune system. It's the flu season. One of the minerals that, that's so critical for immunity is zinc. And many older people are so low in zinc. And how can we strengthen our immune system if we don't know that we need to identify those foods that are critical for, for our immune system and ac actually consume them? So minerals, they play a critical role in our health and well-being. And until we know how important they are, and why we need them. I don't think we're going to make the effort to go find the foods that have them and actually consume them. So the reason why the book was written is to pretty much say to the public, hey, um, I know you know about vitamin C and vitamin D and, and, and that the carbs and the protein and the fat. And even if you're trying to lose weight, which is generally people tend to look at nutrition more when, they, when they're trying to lose weight. But even when you're not trying to lose weight, um, you need to make sure that your diet includes all these important nutrients that you need to survive and have them in the right balance. And, and when I say the right balance, 
it doesn't mean that you should go out and consume a bunch of those minerals because you figure you might need them. You have to have them in the right proportion. Too much of anything can be a problem and too little of anything can be a problem. That's why it is so important that we test routinely, maybe a couple of times a year, once or twice a year, just to see if you're on the right track because um, it, it's so easy to be fooled by the notion that I eat right, therefore I'm okay. And I can tell you from personal experience that I, for most of my life, I've tried to eat healthily. The problem is some of those foods weren't getting into my system. And until I took a proactive approach by testing to see if my, for example, if my vitamin C levels were adequate, then, you know, I would not have known that I had a problem absorbing vitamin C if I didn't test for it. And it, and it wasn't due to age either. It was due to the fact that I just had a, 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 a bad gene that did not allow me to absorb vitamin C from the foods I eat. So I have, I have to get a specially prepared type of vitamin C so that my body can absorb it. And so when I did the before, my vitamin C was low. A couple of months later, it's fine. And it makes a difference in how you feel, in, in how you age. And all these things are important for healthy aging and, and healthy living. So, you know, having, having proper mineral balance and being aware that there are more minerals than the common ones that we are being told about that perform a, such an important role in our, in our health, if we're aware of those um, minerals, then we will make effort to find the foods to get the minerals from. And that, you know, we're told all the time that we need to eat lots of fruits and vegetables, and it's true. But if we tell people not the reason why you need to eat the fruits and vegetables has to do with the fact that they contain important minerals and vitamins and other things, but especially the minerals that, um, that are good for you. And, you know, what we try and do on our website is identify those minerals and nutrients that you get from fruits and vegetables. Now, if we know why we're eating them, then we will make the effort to go find them in the, in, in the supermarket. So hopefully yeah. that message is getting across. That's fantastic and really incredibly great advice. Joy, you know, you talked a little bit about genetics. And I was mm -hmm. curious what you think of programs like 23andMe, which give people information about their heritage markers or in their chromosomes for certain predispositions of, of health. Any, mm -hmm. any thoughts about um, those kinds of programs and how they can help someone manage their health? Yes, I, I think those programs are very, I mean, they're timely, they're, they're, they're very good for, for, being, for managing your health, and here's why. If you know you have a genetic predisposition to, ha to a certain illness or, or a certain condition, what you can do is, is take steps to reduce the likelihood of that condition occurring. And if I, if, I, if I can take the time to even relate it to something personal, I come from a family of um, heart disease, uh, crazy illnesses, diabetes, heart disease, everything, you know, bad, I guess, to some degree, breast cancer, the whole bit. And so I, was, I, I wanted to see what the story was there with me, and, and I did genetic testing. And what I found out is, is that, okay, I, I identify the issue, and then I, I carved out a lifestyle that would not encourage, the, you know, these conditions. So it, it made me more aware that I have to get up and move. It made me more aware that I have to um, eat properly so that the genes don't manifest themselves the way, with the way they're predisposed to being manifested. And so that's what genetic testing does. It tells you what's likely to occur and gives you, the gives you the chance to change course and have your genes express themselves in a way that they're not, you know, that, they, that, they're, not, that they're not predisposed to, to, to express themselves. So I, I would recommend genetic testing to every, if, it, if it's affordable, I would recommend genetic testing to everyone. And so that it, 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 for, it, it kind of forces you to do the right thing. Because if you don't, 
then the genes will just act in the way that they're predisposed to acting, and you will have that hypertension, and you will have the diabetes, and you will have the breast cancer, et cetera. So that, that, I think that's critical. So beyond that, what other um, advice would you, would you give to help people proactively manage their health? Are there, are there specific things you would really like to recommend to, to, to the listeners? Sure. I think, I think the best advice that I can give to anyone is being an aware consumer, healthcare consumer, meaning don't leave the responsibility of your health up to your doctor because um, ultimately that's our responsibility, believe it or not. It's up to us to know that when we go to a doctor and they ask us certain questions, that we need to take the time to provide accurate information to the doctor so that they can do their jobs properly. And even then, you might want to know about your, your condition and because who knows, who know, you know your body best. So make sure you provide relevant and accurate information so that your doctor can provide you with information that you need. And realize that doctors are not gods. They are, they, they, they are limited by time, and so they're relying on us as consumers to provide them with as much information as possible so that they can do their jobs properly. And also ask lots of questions. Educate yourself, for example, even with, at your annual physical. Make sure that when you talk to your doctor, if there are tests that you feel that you need to get, ask your doctor, can, can I get this test? And here's why I'm asking about this test. Uh, recently, I found out that, that even having your appendix removed can be an issue when it comes to your, ability, your immune system. And for years, every time I would do my nutrient testing, I would come back being low in pro, you know, with probiotics, and that affects your immune system. And it turns out that you know, research is now showing that by having your appendix removed, it could affect your, your immune system. Now, these are things that my doctor would not necessarily know, and but, but when I would talk to her, about you know why my numbers were coming back so low uh, for probiotics, she, you know we didn't know until I found out that hey there's some research out there that shows this is why. So we're paying more attention now to my immune system to make sure that it's optimal. But it, it's good to know yourself, know your body, so that you can be a partner with your healthcare professional and communicate in a way that will help you, as opposed to just going to your doctor and saying. I feel this way, they give you some medications and that's it. And then the medications could have side effects or leach out other nutrients and then you have, you know, you feel horrible and you go back and then they say, let, let me try this. The discussion should be more than just that. It should be more, it, it should be more informed. And sounds like more holistic versus sort of specific, you know, it's like we treat one thing and then it creates another thing and then we treat that and it, you know, a kind of a snowball effect. Whereas if we look at the whole, it might might be more effective. In in case yes. you aren't busy enough, you also co-founded <laughs> Mojo Marketing and Media Company. Can you talk about what makes this group distinct and what you hope to accomplish from a social mission standpoint? Right. So um, I am an avid. It, it, it actually started out with with golf, if you can believe that. <laughs> a friend of mine were playing golf. A friend and I were playing golf on the golf course, and we decided um, that there are things that we could do to to actually make a difference in in that industry, in the media industry. So Ed Moses and I um, decided to produce golf events and um, show you know shows that make a difference in various communities and introduce, for example, golf to communities that that may not otherwise have, you know, be able to play golf and and and, and participate in that sport. So we co-produced a, a, a golf event with CBS and we have done some shows and produced them in areas as well where, you know, the community can get involved and give back to the community on that basis. Um, in April, we're working with the LPGA to do one here in California, where, where Proactive Health Labs will be one of the charities that will be benefiting from that event. So what we're trying to do is to, to move sports into communities that would otherwise not be able to participate um, in, in, in that type of sport and, and just make it more an activity-oriented um, situation where 
people identify things that they like to do to move and stay physically active. It, it all comes back to health. Uh, it, I, I'm a firm believer in physical activity. I don't necessarily like to work out. <laughs> so as for as many activities that I can identify that will help people move and stay and stay healthy, I, I try to do that. And that's kind of what uh, Mojo is about. Fantastic. Um, so you've written books. You have proactive health labs. You have the Mojo Marketing. You're the managing partner of a law firm. Uh, but it seems that all your businesses have this health connection. So what's in the future for you? <laughs> My future is simply to continue doing what I'm doing and relate pretty much everything to health. Because let's face it, um, when you take a trip, when you know, so when when you when you take a trip on a flight, you you want to make sure that the pilot is in the best shape ever, right? <laughs> you want to make sure that that pilot is healthy. You want to make sure that the doctor who is doing your surgery is healthy, that and he'll do a good job. Health affects every aspect of our lives, so it's incumbent on us to learn as much about this area and be as healthy as possible because it it affects the way our police officers think and 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 it affects everything it affects our schools it, it you know and i could go on and on it, it's a passion that i have because it infiltrates every aspect of our life not only our personal lives it affects everything so if we can get people healthier my thinking is that crime rates will drop my thinking is that we'll have a better society in general because much of it comes back to the basic issue of nutrition and if we if we if we balance nutritionally it affects our ability to think it affects our ability to move it affects our physical and mental ability so it's really important that we see health as a as a overwhelming issue that our nation has to address and do what we can to address it and make the information simple and easy to understand that will motivate people to be healthy because it affects all aspects of our lives. Joy, that, that is such a fantastic message, and I really appreciate your, your having shared that in such a passionate way because um, I think it's, it's so, so important. Don, do you have any questions for Joy? Oh, oh I, I'm, I'm listening. You know I'm a diabetic, and, and a lot of the things that uh, uh, Joy mentioned, um, I have done in the past, but but the interesting one that I, I found and I wanted her to just expand, uh, my wife believes that Diet Coke and things like that actually contribute to the high, a higher I, A1C. Do you believe that's a fact? I don't know the research behind that, but I do know that um, Diet Coke or Diet Drinks in general do not do anything beneficial for the body. How about that? <laughs> there, yeah. There's no positive. There is no positive in drinking that coke and or any. And I, I, rather than saying that coke, that drinks. Okay. Mm. So it 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 it's it, so it, it it. I am pretty sure it hurts the diabetes. So uh, it, it's it's not good. Well, you know, I'm I, I'm listening. Uh, I said to Anna earlier that. That sometimes our guests become so interesting with the interchange that I become more a listener than a participant. But and uh, on that note, uh, your website again, Joy, so people will know how to reach you. Sure, the website is P as in Paul, H as in Happy, phlabs.org. So proactive health labs dot org or proactivehealthlabs dot com or the abbreviated version phlabs.org. Huh. Wow. And, and we're, yeah. we're, we're, non, we're a nonprofit organization, and our goal pretty much is to, you know, educate people on nutrition and health. You, 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 you should be commended. Uh, uh, your, your efforts, uh, I think, are wonderful. And you get to say the last word. Now, Joy, okay. thank you so, so much for being on the show. And, um, I look forward to actually getting your book and uh, learning a bit more. And um, uh, to everyone, good health. That's the most important thing. Very true. Thanks so much.
Want to know more about health savings accounts for your company or yourself? Go to 2hsa.com and get a free employer's primer. Health savings accounts are a cost-effective way of offering health care benefits to your employees and yourself. HSAs build retirement funds for your employees, improve morale, and reduce your health care benefit costs. For a free employer guide to HSAs, go to 2hsa.com. That's 2hsa.com. Dan Perkins here from Recalculating.biz with your featured book. I want to tell you about a recent interview I had with Bob Bethel, a turnaround specialist with lots of success in small business. Bob's new book is Strengthen Your Business, Fail-Proof Strategies for Small Business. He tells us of his life successes and failures that have made him and his clients so successful. Over the years, Bob has brought 77 companies back from the brink and changed them into thriving, profitable businesses. His energy is amazing, and at 74, he proves that you can still have a great deal to give to others if you just try. His suggestions are easy to understand and very helpful. One insight struck me was that most companies do not have a plan. The old Chinese proverb says, if you don't know where you're going, then any road will take you there, is true today. Bob Beth Bethel's book, Strengthen Your Business, can be found at Amazon.com or can be ordered at your local bookstore. This has been Dan Perkins with your Recalculating.biz featured book. You are listening to Ann Daw and Don Mazella, and the program is Food and Wine Insider. If you have a question or know someone you think our listeners should hear, contact us at foodandwineinsider.com. Remember, our programs are heard every Wednesday and Saturday on this station via amfm247.com or on iHeartRadio, as well as Roku Television. You can listen to past shows at foodandwineinsider.com. And our next guest is Jay Buxbaum, who is Vice President of Royal Wines. We asked him on this program to talk about the wine business in general and kosher wines in particular. Jay, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. Great to be on. Okay, Jay, tell us a little bit about yourself, about Royal Wines, and then Anne has some questions to ask you. Sure. Well, when I I graduated college, I had a degree in accounting. For those of you, this will age me a bit. For those of you remember when the city of New York went through their fiscal records, I'm sorry, fiscal crisis, I was hired as an accountant. I hated it. Then someone said, why don't you come and work in the wine business? I said, I don't like wine. And they said, well, but, you know, it means travel. And I said, okay, you got me at hello. So I've been doing it ever since. Now I've traveled all over the world. I've learned so much about wine and have been uh, taken, you know, done some seminars and tastings and whatever all over the world. So that's, that's the long and short of me. Um, well, tell and in the wine business. About, Go ahead. Now tell us a little bit about Royal Wines. Well, Royal Wine was was actually started under another guy's in 1848 in Czechoslovakia. And the Herzog family who started it uh, in the mid-1900s, right before World War II, um, were, of course, a Jewish family. And they were under um, house arrest and all this kind of stuff. And they're, they're actually their employees who were not Jewish uh, hid them. And they um, left. They left Czechoslovakia in 1948 and began Royal Wine on the Lower East Side of Manhattan in 1948. And it's been around since. And today, we have wineries um, in New York State, in California, and we produce wine in about 19 countries around the world. And I'm going to turn it over to you. you you've got a lot of. Uh, usually, have such good questions. Yeah, thank, and thank you, Don. And hi, Jay. Really, thank you so much for being on Food and Wine Insider. And ah, uh, I really pleasure. appreciate your, thank you. I really appreciate your providing that history. I actually read about it and I was like, wow, that's pretty extraordinary. Um, you know, sort of fourth or fifth generation and eight generations back in terms of the, the Herzog family starting this. Um, right. You know, Royal Wines incorporated the name uh, Kedim which I think means coming from the East. Why was that important? Well, that's so interesting that you ask, because that's a perfect segue, so to speak. Kedem actually has two meanings. Um, It means uh, uh, going forward and as before. So so 
so for example, there are a lot of Hebrew words that, that have multiple meanings. For example, one that is known by many is shalom. Shalom is used both as a greeting and also as a farewell. And kedem means exactly that. Uh, it means as before or going forward. So the objective of the founder in America, that is, when he incorporated and, and, and uh, actually coined the name uh, and registered the name Kedem, was to say, look, you know, we are going to st stick by our traditions of as before, you know, ba dating back to his grandfather in 1848, and, but we're going to look forward and we're going to do Kadima, which is looking ahead and look towards the future, both in terms of, you know, surviving and growing and and um, and also in terms of all the new things that the wine business has to offer and wines have to offer and, and the communities want, etc. So that's that's how the name that's really encapsulates what Keta means. That's really fantastic. You know, there may be lots of misunderstanding about kosher wines and what does it mean to be kosher. Can you dispel some of these myths, I guess, but absolutely, uh, you know, what it really absolutely. does mean to be kosher. Absolutely. Um, it, unlike any other kosher product, the difference between kosher and wait till you hear the whole explanation before everybody drops their jaws. The difference between kosher and non-kosher wine is nothing. Zero. It is exactly the same or certainly can be. Kosher foods, for example, is an ingredient based product so that, for example, you can't have non-kosher ingredients in food. You can't have uh, pork products. You can't have shellfish products. You can't have gelatins. You can't have or, or even meats or you know animal pr products that are not killed in a certain way. So that's a uh, in a food kosher means what is the ingredient? Are the ingredients in fact acceptable or certified? In kosher wine, it's only the oversight. Exactly the same way non-kosher wine is made is the same way kosher wine is made. The only difference being that from the crushing of the bottle, I'm sorry, from the crushing of the grape until the bottle is sealed, it is overseen and handled by an observant rabbinical or, or observant uh, Jewish crew. And that has a lot to do with um, paganism uh, used a wine in their sacrificial rites uh, millennia ago. And so the rabbis, in order to make sure that it wasn't used and defiled spiritually, not physically, because like I said, kosher wine is the same, whether it's, whether it's kosher or non, as non-kosher wine, um, they wanted to make sure that it wasn't spiritually defiled, so they wanted to oversee the whole process from the crushing until the sealing of the bottle. There you go. I, I have learned It's a long-winded discussion, but, no. but one, of, one of the funny, if I may, one of the funny, sure. you know, curious curiosities about it is, is that when the major Jewish communities came to this country. They came to this country from Europe through Ellis Island and, you know, stopped at the Statue of Liberty. And, the, and they needed wine for everything that they did. They needed wine for their weddings and their bar mitzvahs and their circumcisions and their, you name it, you know, Friday night dinners, et cetera, et cetera. The only grapes that were available were the Labrusca variety. The Labrusca is not the same as Lambrusco. Labrusca is a, a certain strain of grape which were very hardy, but also very low in sugar. And so in order to make it palatable, this Concord grape from the Labrusca variety needed sugar. And so it became known that kosher wine in America was sweet, syrupy Concord. That is not, that is just happens to be because of where, where it's coming from. Nothing to do with the fact that it makes it kosher and non. And that's where the real myth in America of kosher wine being sweet and syrupy comes from. Excellent, because I, I think I had the same perception. Um, you know, you talked a little bit earlier about uh, where you make your products today, but how do you keep control of that purity of the products? Because you do produce all over the world as well as, as in the U.S. So that's a great, great question. Um, I'll give you an example. Just this year, for the first time in history, we are releasing a, a, a first crew Bordeaux, I'm sorry, a Grand Cru Bordeaux, um, it's, I think it's a second crew, called Las Combes, or uh, Cantonac Brown, or Leoville Pofier. All of these are non-kosher wineries that are producing a small batch of kosher wine for us. It's exactly the same wine that they produce for themselves. 
The only difference is, is that we have a crew, literally, we have a crew of between, depending on how big the production is, of between four and 25 um, people that go out, go, go throughout Europe from winery to winery and oversee and actually hands-on make the wine in somebody else's winery. So that's for when we do it in somebody else's winery. In California, which is probably our most famed um, brand, and that's the Herzog and the Baron Herzog wines, we have our own winery in Oxnard. In fact, we have a wonderful restaurant that is highly Zagat rated and for many years was the, was the best, considered the best restaurant in, in the county. Um, we make all of our wines under our supervision with our own people. Um, and so that's how, that's how we make sure that the, in New York State, and we welcome everybody to come and visit our wineries, both in California, in Oxnard, and in um, um, Milton, I'm sorry, Marlboro, New York. We have a winery upstate where we make not only our, yes, the famous Kiddush wine, the sweet syrupy Concord, but we also make our great grape juice, the Kedem grape juice, which is ubiquitous everywhere and, and quite, quite a delicious product. Wonderful. You know, I, I watched several of your YouTube videos and your passion for wine. So I, I kind of was chuckling when you said you knew nothing about wine and you didn't really like wine. Right. So that was really surprising to me. But Anna, and if I remember correctly from one of them, you have your own wine cellar. So what should people know about wines? And in particular, why should they consider a kosher wine? Okay, so in my view, there's only two reasons to consider a kosher wine. One is because you yourself are kosher and therefore need to have it kosher uh, in order to enjoy it. But, but if, and if you don't need it to have it kosher, consider it because it's just good. Ignore the fact that it's kosher. And, you know, buy it. I'll give you an example. Bartolo Moscato di Asti is the largest selling imported Italian Moscato in America approaching 500,000 cases. And the reason why it's the largest is not because the Jewish community consumes all of that. In fact, we estimate or guesstimate that only about 5 to 8% is sold to kosher consumers. The rest is just sold to everybody because it's just a damn good bottle of wine. And the same is true of so many of our Herzog wines that have won so many medals and gotten so many accolades and gotten such high marks from think places like Wine Enthusiast and Wine Spectator that you should consider kosher wine simply because the wine is good. There's also, and this is only a small part of it though, and, uh, is that kosher wines, there are ingredients in the last 80 years that are allowed to be used in making wine that we do not use in kosher wine and many non-kosher wineries don't either. Examples are gelatin as a fining agent. Example, another example is sodium casinate, which is acidifying agent. So instead of, for example, we using gelatin as a fining agent, we'll just use better filtration systems. Instead of using sodium casinate as an acidifying agent, because you want to you know, change the acidity or make it more acidic so that it, it lasts longer or that it's well, more well balanced, we'll use just higher acid grape wine or grape juice so it's more natural in that respect but many non-kosher wineries um, have those standards as well but kosher wineries always do now from the herzog family themselves are they still family members um in this eighth generation that are still involved and what do they do <laughs> oh my gosh you know <laughs> the greatest compliment that i get is i've been with them uh, I don't even want to tell you how many years, but the greatest compliment I get is people after I, because because I'm so passionate about it, is people will say to me, buyers will say to me, Jay, call up your family and tell them we need a better price. You know, now I'm not part of the family, but yes, the answer is is that the entire family is involved. Uh, there are now, I think, three or four generations working within the company right now. They are really wonderful people and bosses to have and uh they're not only you know good um good stewards of their business but they're good stewards of the environment we do a lot of um i forget the, what it's called um there's certain words that they use for not organic but 
I forget, in their vineyards, but they're also good stewards of their communities, donating wine and, and time and, and, you know, uh, ser- uh, services and even um, money to a lot of community. So, yes, the answer is the Herzog is still involved. Is still very. We were one of the first ones, for example, the Herzog was one of the first ones to put Braille on the back label so that wine lovers that couldn't, couldn't see could read the back label. And this goes back, I'm talking about 25 years ago. Now it's, it's a little bit more common, but not as common. So these are the kinds of people that are, are they're still involved in the winery, and the Herzogs definitely run and, and work very hard at what we do here at, at the Royal Wine. That's wonderful. You're, you're both the VP of marketing, and you also um, are the director of consumer education. Tell us a little bit about what you do in the whole area of consumer education. Well, I'll give you I'll give you an example. Uh, last last night, was it last night? It was last night or the night before. There's a really great restaurant in Long Island called Doma. It's a Land and Sea. It's called Doma Land and Sea. And I did a seminar, not in this case, not for consumers, but I did a seminar for their staff of fourteen of uh, eighteen um, servers. And we we I taught them about not uh, not only about how to serve wine and how to sell wine on the floor, but also what are the nuances? What makes, what makes wine, you know, what makes a Cabernet from a warm growing region such as uh, the Golan Heights in Israel go with their, with their strip steak? And what makes a mosaic blend coming from the Judean hills go with their, um, with their lamb chops? So, you know, and I do this with consumers all the time. So, um, you know, it's important because consumers often are, and, and the main thing is to take the mystique out of wine. It's just something to enjoy. Nobody has this fantastic mystique about orange juice. You enjoy it. And you know that everybody knows that, or most people, if you, if you ask, uh, what's the best orange juice, you know, everybody will raise their hand and they'll go Tropicana, right? Because, and, and I say to them, why, how do you know that? And they say, because we drink a lot of orange juice. And I, that's the mystique that I try to take out of it. Just enjoy it. And as time goes on and as you try more wine over a longer period of time, you'll just begin to, your palate will begin to become automatically more aware and more apprised of what you're drinking. So what are your favorite wines and why? My favorite wines, you know, I, I used to have like specific favorites for years, but the diversity and the, um, my, let me put it this way. Everybody knows me as the white guy, you know, meaning that I love white wines and I love Chardonnays. And I think that, that we as a community, and I, I don't mean just the Jewish community, I mean the wine drinking community and the communities in general are, are so over focused on red wines that we miss the flexibility and the usability and the friendly ability of white wines and we don't drink enough of them so chardonnays especially from uh, russian river area a uh, herzog russian river chardonnay is one of my favorites castel c from the judean hills in israel is one of my favorites and and some of the great chablis that we're just now starting to be starting we are starting to bring in are really great but i also love the complexity of red wines that that are that have many different grapes in them so that if they're well balanced and they're well integrated you not only get a really rich flavorful delicious wine but you also get the complexities that you can't get from a straight cabernet or a straight syrah or a straight merlot so those are those are some of the guidelines that i have for people when they ask me what i like wonderful thank you so much for sharing that so what's on the horizon for Royal Wines? You've been in business such a long time. You're in so many different countries producing wine. Um, and, you know, we talked about wines, but I think you also have spirits and liqueurs. What are the, what's on the horizon for Royal Wines? Well, I think, I think the, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of do a rewind because I think the main objective to, you know, when, when they first started the winery in 1948 in America, their main objective was to exclusively service the Jewish community that was just aching for a good 
wine and good winemaker and good wines to, to drink. And they did a great job, and we continue to do that, and that's still our core mission. However, now the future, what we're looking at is taking the next step. We, we have done it with Bartonura Moscato, but I think so many of our wines, especially the wines from Herzog and Baron Herzog, especially a ton of wines that are coming out of Israel, as you could see from the Wine Spectator article about a year and a half ago and ongoing reviews by so many other wine magazines that wines from Israel are wonderful, uh, is to take those wines and to say, you know what, forget the fact that they're kosher, even though that's, that's important to us, just taste them. And we're looking to cross over more and more, as we did with Bartura and now Jeunesse, which is a kind of semi-dry Cabernet and Chardonnay and, and um, so on from California. We're looking to do crossover more and more into the general market with all of our wines or more of our wines, I should say. And what types of spirits and liqueurs are you looking, um, are you producing some now, but what, what other kinds of things are you producing? So besides? that's a great question. We, we have, you know, we have a local distributor in New York. And since we were in the stores anyway, uh, Morty Herzog, who is you know, really a brilliant guy and very progressive thinker, said, you know, we're in the stores anyway. We don't sell any spirits to speak of, to speak of. Let's 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 start selling spirits. We're you know our salesman is in there anyway, and we started doing that. Initially, um, about six seven years ago, was just you know to fill kind of the gaps. But now we're developing our own brand. So for example, we have a Boondocks, which is a bourbon, which is you know it, it has real pedigree, has one of the uh, one of the most well known. Um, um, oh gosh, I forget the name. Not a winemaker. When it's a spirit produ uh, spirit maker, it's called a. Uh, oh, I forget. But anyway, one of the most well known spirit guys that is making this Boondocks. We laid away. It won't be. You know, we're not looking to do the low end. We're we're looking as we do with everything. Every category, whether it's six dollars or you know two hundred and fifty dollars retail, it's got to be at the top of its quality within that category and price range. So that's what we're doing with our spirits. We're doing it with our boondocks. We're doing it with a vodka called Lvov, L-V-O-V, -V, which comes from um, Poland. Um, also very high quality, beautiful packaging, but again, mostly high quality of what's in the bottle. So, and, and we're doing it with a whole bunch of Iraqs um, that, are, that, are, that are actually made here in America, which is an anise-based liqueur. So those are the directions that we're going in, looking to make the, just as we, our background in, in wine is to make the best we can, our background in spirits, and it's a new one, granted, is to try to do the best we can within each category. That's fabulous. Um, Jay, about you a little bit, you know, you said that you went into accounting, you got your accounting degree, and then you wound up in wine. I was just curious to know if there was, if there was anything you would have ever wanted to change about your past or you would say, hey, I, I'd like a do-over, maybe sort of that going forward and where you come from notion, um, what would it be? No do-overs, no do-overs. You know, even the most <laughs> terrible mistakes I've made, and I've made a bunch, I look at as a wonderfully um, good experience to teach me how not to do those things again. So. You know, I, I remember, uh, for example, I mean, I, I'm almost embarrassed to talk about it, but I will talk about it. I remember, for example, when I first got started with business, about two or three years into it, I, I was kicking off our entire line of wines, working for another company at that time, more than 30 years ago. Our entire line of wines, I think it was in Connecticut, and they put away the entire Friday morning for my presentation. You know, the wines were set up and the, in those days there was no, believe it or not, it was, it was before cell phones, before emails, before any of that, you know, and I didn't show up <laughs> and the guy never, you know, the distributor never talked to me again. I, I just had it wrong on my calendar. And, you know, so it, it's, it's quite an embarrassing tale for me, but I think it was a healthy one in retrospect, as long as you, what, if you take your mistakes and you incorporate them into your life in a positive manner, 
there should be no do-overs at all. You should use those mistakes and, and move forward. Um, so I, I wouldn't do anything different, you know. I, I went with the flow. And, and I, I, you know, it's been a pleasure ever since. The, the, the thing that I will say, and this is a philosophy that I, I share with our salespeople as well as anybody who listen, if you want to do a job, don't do the job because the boss is going to be happy. Don't do it great because it's going to, it's going to, you know, it's going to get you a raise, which is important, but do it great because it'll make you happy. They did a survey, AOL and so many other um, things, magazines and, and surveys have done surveys where they ask people, what is the most important thing about your job? And you would think that the first thing on the list would be the money, right? The remuneration. But you know what? It's at least second or third. The first thing on the list is job satisfaction. And let me tell you, when I sit down and have a barbecue or dinner and I'm with friends and family, some of whom are doctors or lawyers or accountants or whatever, and I tell them about, oh, man, I had a really late, late, late night last night. I really worked hard. I went to this tasting, and then after the tasting, I had to, I had to have dinner with the manager and, and his staff, and we tasted all these wines. And they reach across the table, of course, tongue-in-cheek a little bit, they reach across the table and are ready to choke me, you know? Yeah. I mean, this is, a, this is a wonderful, it's a wonderful industry to be in. People are generally so nice. You're, you're making people happy. I'll never forget that um, Feich Herzog, who is one of the sons of the founder here in America, when we had a sales, a national sales meeting, you know, everybody was talking about their part of the business, the marketing department, the payroll department, the this department. He comes to production, and you'd think he, he's the guy who was in charge of production at the time, and he, you'd think he'd talk about production. But he gets up there and he says, guys, and ladies, remember, we're not in the wine business. You know what business we're in? We're in the celebration business. We're in the bar mitzvah business. We're in the wedding business. We're in the, you know, and, you know, in the graduation business. And if you take that, in whatever you do, but certainly in the wine business, if you take that with you to the street and to your job, you're always going to have a smile on your face. Well, Jay, that's great messages and great philosophy uh, <laughs> to really end our conversation. So our time went by so quickly. You've been incredibly entertaining and informative, and uh, it's been such a pleasure to have you on the on the show. Don, I'm going to turn it to you to close out. Why don't you tell us um, uh, your website, and uh, we'll also have your website up on, on uh, Food and Wine Insider, but uh, would love for you to share the, the website for your business. www.royalwine.com, uh, herzogcellars.com, and if, if any of your listeners are here in New York on February 5th, this is probably one of the largest, if not the largest, wine shows in New York that we are hosting at Pier 60 on February 5th, and it's under KFWE, you could Google it, KFWE 2018, or KFWE 18, um, and there's still, I think, some tickets available. It will be sold out, and there will not be any tickets at the door being sold, but you're going to be able to taste, oh, I don't know, over 300 wines and uh, food from over 30 restaurants, and I think it's just a great night out and, and a great date night out. I mean, it's just amazing, and especially if you're a wine lover. So those are some of the things that you should be looking at. Oh, fantastic. So that's February 5th. Which pier? Pier 60 pier, in New York. Pier 60, and it's KFWE 2018. And, um, Correct. Sounds like a great place to be. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you again for, for being with us. Jay, it's really been a pleasure. Oh, pleasure's all mine, and thank you for inviting us. Okay. Thank you. Food and Wine Insider. You can listen to past shows at foodandwineinsider.com. Want to know more about health savings accounts for your company or yourself? Go to 2hsa.com and get a free employer's primer. Health savings accounts are a cost-effective way of offering health care benefits to your employees and yourself. HSAs build retirement funds for your employees, improve morale, and reduce your health care benefit costs. For a free employer guide to HSAs, go to 
2hsa.com. That's 2hsa.com. You've been listening to Food and Wine Insider with Ann Daw and Don Mazella. Want to join us on a future show? Contact us at foodandwineinsider.com. Until next time, have a passion for food, wine, and profits. And think of our program, Food and Wine Insider. <laughs>